Well, I also am just sort of glowing with pride and identification to with this uh, wonderful department and the way it has uh, gotten better and better, but with a very consistent kind of style and values of combining first-rate social science with contributing to public service in a way that is uh, really quite unique. Although I like to think that UCSD actually has some of the same qualities. And I've talked with other people here. It's interesting that those of us who are academics will also say, well, you know, I feel Dartmouth is really a lot like MIT here, you know, and I think we try to bring some of this to whatever universities uh, where we are currently working. Well, I uh, came to MIT in 1968 uh, because as a China specialist, my professor at Mount Holyoke College, Jean Grossholtz, who claims to be the really the first MIT a PhD from this department, because, but it wasn't yet a department. She got her degree in 1961. And uh, she said, now, don't take the admissions offers from these traditional China Center places, Harvard and Michigan and Berkeley or Stanford, because you'll just be in this area studies ghetto. You want to go where the real cutting edge social science is being taught. So you will be a first rate social scientist first and a China scholar second. So I took her advice and uh, later I've learned there is kind of a Mount Holyoke uh, MIT pipeline. There are a bunch of other women even before me like Kathy Kelleher or before that Sandy Kenyon. I was just at Mount Holyoke a few days ago Sandy Kenyon was there, Phyllis Ellickson. So there are, um, and now, look, on this panel, the two women here are both Mount Holyoke graduates. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so when I came here, I had absolutely no inkling at all that I would ever have the opportunity to serve in government. Um, I was and am a comparative politics specialist and I don't think I ever took any international relations courses, actually. Um, and my uh, development of my framework of how to think about uh, the Chinese political system emerged uh, in, frankly, in conflict with Lucian Pai. Um, I came here and discovered that this was kind of the high church of political culture studies. And political culture, from my perspective as a China person, was an approach that I felt was sort of an intellectual dead end. It, to me, it kind of came down to, well, they do it that way because they're Chinese. And, but, Lucian was a real gentleman and a very, very smart man. And so he and I had a very interesting relationship of mutual respect in which I had to kind of figure out why I disagreed with this approach and what I thought instead uh, explained the way Chinese people behave both at the mass level and the elite level. And what I came to is uh, a framework that is much more about institutional incentives and how they uh, influence the way people's, people behave. And I originally did it uh, in research on middle, middle school students interviewing refugees in Hong Kong to uh, write a book about that and uh, ultimately about the policymaking process. So um, this, and of course, as I watched China change from the time that I first started doing research in Hong Kong in 1969, interviewing refugees, and then was very fortunate to China opened up 
just then. And so in 1971, I was able to start visiting China and doing research there. We saw with the introduction of um, market reform under Deng Xiaoping in 1978, uh, 79, behavior in China, economic behavior, political behavior across the board changed dramatically, which just reinforced my uh, belief that Chinese culture is not characterologically one thing, but it is always changing and changing in response to the structure of the incentives in which people operate. You know, when I first visited China, you saw lots of people on construction sites just leaning on their shovels. And the factories were empty because absenteeism in factories was rampant. You change the incentives, and now Chinese people work harder than workers in any other part of the world. And other workers in different countries feel they can't keep up. So um, see, I'm still arguing with Lucian here. <laughs> so um, when I was asked to go serve in government, I was uh, petrified and thrilled. Uh, it was in 1997 that I went uh, into the East Asia Bureau of the State Department to try to work on this bipartisan effort that we've had over many administrations since Nixon of trying to find some uh, way of cooperating with China uh, despite the differences in our political systems and despite the fact that uh, this is where two countries engaged in what international relations experts call a power transition. Uh, not meaning that the U.S. is on the decline, but that China is rising. So, uh, but I was uh, very enthusiastic about doing that because given the transformation I'd seen in China, I really believe that China's future was completely open-ended and that there was every possibility that with smart diplomacy on the part of the decision makers of both countries, we could actually manage this relationship and find a way to cooperate. Now, um, as a domestic politics person, I, uh, of course, what I brought to bear as a uh, political appointee, but a deputy assistant secretary, but I had excellent access um, because of um, being a political appointee. And I mostly brought a kind of framework or theory about the Chinese policymaking process. So frequently when we were debating about uh, how to respond to China or what to propose to China, I would say, well, I think we should do X instead of Y because I really think that they can do X. I really think that this fits uh, their domestic uh, balance of power and the interests of different important players. I don't think we should do Y because this would really be hard for China to do. And I remember one time having a discussion like this in Madeleine Albright's office, and one of her top aides, when I made this argument, I don't think we should do this because China really can't do it, given their domestic politics. He spoke up and said, but Susan, this is a communist country. They don't have domestic politics. And uh, Madeleine Albright and I shared a look because, of course, she, uh, as someone who'd studied the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, knew very well that this was complete hogwash, and she turned and told him so. Um, so when I was in government, uh, we had a number, I had lived through, we made good progress, I have to say. We really, and I could talk more about how I think we did that, but we managed to get a lot of, um, 
concessions from China, important behavioral changes on nonproliferation in particular, well, uh, human rights, no success at all, which uh, is not surprising but very frustrating. Um, and on trade, of course, the great accomplishment was bringing China into the World Trade Organization. So I guess, um, but in several key uh, incidents, I saw vividly how China's leadership was willing to sacrifice good relations with the United States for the sake of uh, the political survival of the Communist Party leaders. Uh, I saw this in particular when we mistakenly bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade in May of 1999, and I was responsible for putting together the explanation and delivering it and everything. And of course, what happened then is that Jiang Zemin um, because this was just a few weeks before what would have been the 10th anniversary of Tiananmen. He basically tolerated, indeed facilitated, the uh, demonstrations, violent demonstrations by Chinese students against the Chinese embassy and uh, Chinese, I mean, against the um, US embassy in Beijing and our consulates in other cities. So he was willing to put the whole relationship with the United States at risk in order to preserve, make sure that these demonstrations, demonstrators did not go to Jungnan High, the leadership compound, or to Tiananmen, and instead were focused on the external threat. Um, very traumatic event. Uh, just a month before that, however, I had seen how even in the United States, uh, speaking of two-level games, after we, Charlene Barshevsky, had negotiated a very strong WTO accession agreement with China, in the end, uh, Bob Rubin, the Treasury Secretary, and other domestic policy advisors convinced President Clinton not to sign the deal when Zhu Rongji, the premier, was visiting the United States. So, um, and again, uh, Secretary Albright, Sandy Berger, all the foreign policy people said, you gotta be kidding. You know, you are humiliating Zhu Rongji. Uh, this will put the whole agreement at risk, they'll go back and we may not be able to get the deal again. And, uh, but the domestic policy advisor said, well, we'll have to go to Congress to get permanent normal trade relations with China. And if we sign the deal here, it'll look like we compromise too much in order to sign it in time when Zhu Rengji was visiting. So let's just wait a few weeks and then we'll, we'll sign it. And we all yelled and screamed to no avail, and, but as soon as the president told Zhu Rongji this, he was aware of the fact that he'd made a huge mistake and tried to recoup even when Zhu Rongji was in the United States, but that didn't work out. So the combination of these two incidents both of which reflect the powerful impact of domestic politics on foreign policy, was that we had to, the president had to really chase Jiang Zemin to try to restart the WTO negotiations. It was really touch and go, and I was on the last negotiating team, and I tell you, the Chinese made us uh, pay a price for all of these uh, delays and humiliations. Uh, Charlene Barshevsky very carefully tried to make sure that the deal we finally did sign was roughly as good as the original one, but there was a lot of hand-waving uh, that went on, and I'd say there were clawbacks uh, that were not insignificant because of that. So uh, all of that learning 
on my part, um, even though I'm a comparative politics person, I came back to the university determined to show my colleagues I was not brain dead because I'd been in Washington for three years and wrote a book called China Fragile Superpower about the impact of domestic politics on US-China relations. Thank you.